So we've been talking about the impulse function, been talking about its definition, its properties, things like that. Let's go ahead and work some very specific examples where we can use these properties and actually use them to simplify some computations. So what we're going to do in this four-part problem, so we'll work four real small problems, is we're going to use some of these properties that we've been talking about to work some specific integrals where we'll get to use a sifting property and things like that. So part A, we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine 3.2 pi t times delta of t minus 1 dt. So this is the integral that we need to work. And we know what happens when we integrate the product of a signal with an impulse. We end up with the sifting property sifting out the value of our signal at the location of the impulse. So when confronted with an, like an, with an integral like this, the first thing to note, most importantly, is where is the impulse located? This impulse is located at time t equals 1, because that's when this argument goes to 0. When t is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. And t equals 1 is within the integration bounds. So we will integrate across this impulse response. So we can go ahead and use the sifting property now. What that means is I can replace the product with the signal evaluated at that time, because we know when we take a signal times an impulse, we're left with the same impulse, but the signal evaluated at that time. So I end up with sine of 3.2 pi times 1, which is just a constant. I can bring this outside, and I'm left with the integral from minus infinity to infinity of this impulse function, and we know when we integrate across an impulse, we get 1. So the net result of this is just the value sine of 3.2 pi. So that is the result of this integral. Let's do another one, part b. Let's work the integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus alpha t squared times delta of t plus 5. Again, one of the first things I like to do when confronted with something like this is figure out where is the impulse located in time. This is located at time t equals negative 5, because when t is equal to negative 5, negative 5 plus 5 is 0, so the argument is 0. So this is located at t equals negative 5, and negative 5 is within the integration bounds of the integral. So I will integrate across this impulse. So now we can go ahead and just use the sifting property. We know that when we have a signal times an impulse, and we integrate across the impulse, what we get out is the signal evaluated at the location of the impulse. So we know the result of this is going to be my underlying signal evaluated at the time where the impulse is located. So one way to write that mathematically is with this vertical bar, which says evaluate this quantity at this point. So I need to evaluate the signal e to the minus alpha t squared at the point t equals negative 5, which basically just means replace t with negative 5. So if I replace t with negative 5, I have negative 5 times negative 5, that's 25, and I'm left with e to the minus 25 alpha. All right, let's do another one, part C. This one's going to be very similar to part B. The only difference is the integral is no longer from minus infinity to infinity. It's from 0 to infinity. In part B, we already figured out where this impulse is located. It is located at time t equals negative 5. So something very important has changed now. This impulse is not located inside the integration bounds. It's located outside the range of integration. So this product right here, from 0 to infinity, is 0 everywhere. So really, this product from 0 to infinity is 0. If I integrate 0, what do I get? I get 0. So that's exactly what I get for this part. So there are three different examples of using the sifting property of the integral. In, uh, not of the integral, I'm sorry, the sifting property of the impulse function. In this last part, let's just do a refresher of what happens when I have a signal times an impulse, but I'm not going to integrate it. I'm just going to take the product of a continuous time signal times an impulse, and we'll simplify that. So in this problem, I've chosen this polynomial in t. So it is t cubed plus 4t squared plus 3t minus 6, and I am multiplying it by the impulse delta of t. We talked previously what happens. We're going to be left with just an impulse, so I like to write that down first, and the density or height of that impulse is going to be scaled by the value of the signal 
at the location of the impulse. This impulse is obviously located at time zero, so what I need to compute is the value of my signal at time zero. So I can do that by replacing all the t's with zeros. So I'm gonna have a zero cubed plus four t squared, which is four zero squared, plus a three times zero, minus six. So most of these terms go away. Zero cubed, four times zero squared, three times zero, those are all zero, and I'm left with just minus six. So this big old nasty thing simplifies to just minus six times delta t. So there's a handful of examples of using properties of the impulse function to simplify different integrals and different products of continuous time signals with impulse functions.